This is uh, how groups control our behavior. Uh, this is chapter 9. Let's go ahead and get started. A group is two or more people who interact with and influence one another and in so doing consider themselves as a group. Human brain the human brain is adapted to maintain cohesion in groups up to about 150 people. Most groups contain less than four people. Groups normally last for an extended length of time, but as in the case of fans at an athletic event, it may only be for a few moments. Social psychologists feel that groups exist because people need to feel a sense of belonging in many of the things that they do, and this is known as affiliation. Uh, this is a group of, says Aryan Nation there, group of fascists. That's a fascist salute, by the way, so try to stay away from the fascist salute. One of the oldest concepts in social psychology is that people perform better and faster when in the presence of other people. This is known as social facilitation. The concept of social facilitation not only includes athletic events, but also is present in all species and most activities, including sexual activities among breeding pairs of rats. As weird as that may sound. However, social facilitation does not always take place. In fact, with more complex activities, the presence of others actually tends to hinder performance. According to the work by Robert Zients, uh, the uh, anxiety caused by the presence of others inhibits complex tasks, but facilitates simple tasks. Athletes tend to be more energized when they are given support. For this reason, home field advantage is very important since the athletes are more likely to be supported in their own territory. This is no truer in any sport other uh, more than soccer, where almost 70% of the games are won by the home team. While individuals tend to gain comfort from being around other people, too many people tend to have the opposite effect. When people are crammed in shoulder to shoulder, they tend to have the same reactions. Close together, people tend to have higher pulse rates and higher blood pressure. Nicholas Cottrell feels that the reason individuals perform differently when people are watching is because the individual is concerned about how others are evaluating them. Researchers have discovered people perform better when their co-actor is slightly superior, Arousal decreases when a high-status group is diluted with people the performer doesn't care about. People who worry about evaluations are the ones most affected by their presence. Social pressure is the most intense when the people are unfamiliar and hard to keep an eye on. Researchers have found that when a performer is distracted, they are more aroused, whether the distraction is human or not. Robert Zients has shown that people react to the presence of another person, whether they are evaluating or not. Joggers are energized when running with someone else, no matter how good they are. Researchers have discovered that when people are working on a group project, people tend to exert less effort toward a common goal than if the people were being held accountably, accountable individually, and this is known as social loafing. John Sweeney refers to, to the people benefiting from social loafing as free riders, individuals who benefit from the group but give little effort in return. One of the downfalls of communism was the prevalence of social loafing. With no impetus to stick out and no incentive to improve, production in communist countries stagnated. While in private production of agriculture, the people outstripped themselves and their neighbors when allowed to grow their own food on less land. People will still watch public television, though they refuse to contribute money to the public television. On challenging tasks, when an individual perceives their portion of the work as indispensable, they work harder. They also work harder when they consider other individuals in their group as unreliable. An individual will, an individual will work harder when their performance will bring select rewards, as with stock options. 
People tend to loaf less when the other members of their group are considered friends rather than strangers. People in collectivist cultures social loaf less than people in individualistic cultures. People who tend to women who tend to be less individualistic than men social loaf less than men. People are more likely to work hard when they are challenging. Uh, there are challenging objectives. They are rewarded for group success. There is a spirit of commitment to the team. Zimbardo's group built a mock prison in the basement of psychology department at Stanford University and paid students to play the role of guard or prisoner. The, the uh, role students played was determined by the flip of a coin. The guards were outfitted with a uniform of khaki shirts and pants, a whistle, a, a police nightstick, and reflecting sunglasses, and the prisoners were outfitted with a loose-fitting smock with an identification number stamped on it, rubber sandals, a cap made from a nylon stocking, and a locked chain attached to one ankle. And that's what they looked like. And that's what the guards looked like. The experiment started with the prisoners being rounded up by arresting them on campus, handcuffing them, and bringing them to the makeshift jail. The experiment was supposed to last for two weeks. The study was to see if they could get these elite college students to start acting like prisoners and guards. The experiment was way too successful as the students quickly adopted their roles. The experiment had to be ended in only six days. The guards were very creative in abuse, verbally harassing, and humiliating the prisoners. The torture was not unknown, and the warden, who was Philip Zimbardo himself, watched and tacitly approved. Nudity was used to humiliate. They even changed guards, and those guards immediately slipped into the same roles. The prisoners almost immediately took on the role of someone without hope passive, helpless, withdrawn. Some prisoners became so anxious and depressed that they had to be released early to save their sanity. Other prisoners planned escapes and retaliations against the guards. In 2004, American military guards routinely abused prisoners in Abu Ghraib, a prison in Iraq. They phys uh, physical beating, sexual abuse, and psychological humiliation. The American public was shocked by pictures of these abuses. A few bad apples happened to end up in the unit of guarding the prisoner. What's bad is the barrel, according to Zimbardo. And so we're the good guys. I can't, can't happen here. This is what they did to the prisoners in, in uh, Abu Ghraib. There's, this is a lady, actually. They stripped them naked, made them walk around. She put a dog leash on this, this individual. Made them walk around naked, covered them in mud. Made them um, act as if they were having sex with each other. <clears throat> group cohesiveness are the qualities of, of a group that bind uh, members together and promote liking between members. The more cohesive a group is, the more its members are likely to stay in the group, take part in group activities, try to recruit new like-minded uh, members. If task requires close cooperation, cohesiveness helps performance. Cohesiveness can interfere with optimal performance, an example is how Kennedy and his administration dealt with the Bay of Pigs incident. Because the incident happened at the beginning of Kennedy's administration and the people around Kennedy were tightly a tightly knit group, no one argued against Kennedy's decision. And this is what happened. Uh, Fidel Castro took over the Cuban government in 1959. Um, Kennedy was elected president in 1960. A group of uh, Cuban immigrants, the people that had fled Cuba when the communists took over, decided that they were going to liberate Cuba. Uh, so they put together an army, 
uh, and they recruited the United States to help. Um, they recruited the United States, and, and the United States provided assistance uh, through the CIA, and Kennedy approved all of this. So in 1961, the uh, Cuban immigrants attacked uh, their home island of Cuba uh, at the Bay of Pigs, and it was a fiasco. It lasted for about three days. And, and in the end, uh, the immigrants were, were soundly defeated by the Cuban military. Group members tend to be alike in age, sex, beliefs, race, ethnicity, and opinions. Why are they similar? They are attracted to and likely recruit similar others. The groups operate in ways that encourage similarity in the members. Homogenous groups are more cohesive. Diverse groups perform better. To examine the relationship between a business's performance and its racial and gender diversity, Herring in 2009 conducted a correlational study of over 1,000 U.S. workplaces and found a positive association between both types of diversity with uh, sales revenue and number of customers. These results seem to indicate a positive relationship between diversity and a business's bottom line. But as you know, because these data are only correlational, we cannot draw conclusions here regarding one variable causing another. Large groups can also lead to some pretty horrendous behavior among people. During World War II, Japanese troops systematically raped and murdered 400,000 Jap uh, Chinese civilians in Nanking over a two-week period after the surrender of the city. Nanking... During the German genocide of the European Jewish population, the systematic murder of the population progressed from shooting and burying to gassing and burning. People perform in groups uh, what they would not have the social support to do alone because of deindividuation. Deindividuation is a loss of self awareness and evaluation, apprehension. Uh, it occurs in group situations that foster responsiveness to group norms, good or bad. A group has the power not only to arouse its members, <clears throat> but also to render them unidentifiable. It is the group's action, not the individual's, and this is known as deindividuation. Brian Mullen in 1986 content analyzed newspaper accounts of 60 lynchings committed in the United States between 1899 and 1946 and discovered an interesting fact. The more people there were in the mob, the greater the savagery and viciousness with which they killed their victims. Similarly, Robert Watson in 1973 studied 24 cultures and found that warriors who hid their identities before going into battle, for example by using face and body paint, were significantly more likely to kill, torture, or mutilate captive prisoners than warriors who did not hide their identities. And this is a Japanese samurai uh, helmet, and this is a helmet from, uh, from uh, ancient Greece. The robes and hoods of the Ku Klux Klan uh, cloak its members in a anonymity. Their violent behavior is consistent with research on de-individuation. Lynch mobs lynch with impunity, rioters in a faceless mob loot, large crowds of people around a suicide jumper will bait and jeer them to jump. People in crowded cities are more likely to loot and vandalize uh, than people in small, less crowded cities. The individuation does not require face-to-face -face contact. For example, feeling less inhibited on social media, that's anonymous. Uh, cyberspace provides advantages for the free and open discussion of difficult topics, but the cost seems to be a reduction in common civility. The phenomenon of the Internet troll is a modern example of deindividuation, made possible by the feelings of anonymity that often go along with being online. In January of 2006, the Washington Post had, a temporary, had to temporarily shut down its website 
post.blog, after the site was deluged with postings from angry readers, many of whom wrote obscene or insulting comments. The flap was over the claim by the Washington Post reporter that admitted felon Jack a Abramoff had made substantial campaign con contributions to both major parties. The Post later published a correction, noting that Abramoff had contributed mostly to the Republican Party but not before their website was flooded with responses not fit for, for a family newspaper. Groups will do well only if the, the most talented member can convince the others that he or she is right, which is not always easy, given that many of us bear a strong resemblance to mules when it comes to admitting that we are wrong. You undoubtedly know what it's like to try to convince a group to follow your idea, be faced with opposition and disbelief, and then have to sit there and watch the group make the wrong decision. Process loss is any aspect of a group interaction that inhibits good problem solving. In some groups, people don't listen to each other. One person is allowed to dominate in the, discu the discussion while the others tune out. Process loss can occur for a number of reasons. Groups might not try hard enough to find out who the most competent member is. The most competent member might find it difficult to disagree with everyone else. Communication problems can arise. Groups tend to focus on the information they share and ignore facts known to only some members of the group. Subsequent research has focused on ways to get groups to focus more on unshared information. Group discussion should last long enough to get beyond what everyone already knows. Assign different group members to specific areas of expertise so that they know that they, they alone are the responsible for certain types of information. Transactive, transactive memory is the combined memory of two people that is more efficient than the memory of either individual. By learning to specialize their memories and knowing what their partner is responsible for, couples often do quite well in remembering important information. The same can be true of groups of strangers if they develop a system whereby different people are responsible for remembering different parts of a task. Groupthink is a kind of thinking in which maintaining group cohesiveness and solidarity is more important than considering the facts in a realistic manner. Groupthink is most likely to occur when the group is highly cohesive, isolated from contrary opinions, and ruled by a directive leader who makes his or her wishes known. While more authoritarian governments commonly practice or participate in groupthink, occurrences in American history include Pearl Harbor, the Bay of Pigs invasion, the Vietnam War, and Watergate. Bay of Pigs, I've already explained to you what happened at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, Kennedy signed off on it, and it was a fiasco. Watergate. Uh, Watergate, the Republican uh, Party under Richard Nixon decided that they would uh, <laughs> that they would bug the Democratic headquarters to find out what was going on. This was uh, during the election of 1972, and Nixon was elected president by a landslide, actually, but uh, because of Watergate, he lost his job. He had to resign. Uh, the Iran-Contra affair. In the Iran-Contra affair, <clears throat> Congress had decided that uh, we weren't going to do anything uh, to... Uh, uh, there was a war going on. This was in 1980, and there was a war going on between uh, Iran and uh, Iraq. And since Iran had kicked us out in uh, 1976, we decided that we weren't going to do anything with them. We couldn't trade with them. Um, but they were fighting a war against Iraq at the time. Uh, so, and we, we, there was a group in Nicaragua called the Contras who were fighting against the, um, the Marxist government in Nicaragua. That, that uh, Ronald Reagan really, he really liked these guys. And the reason he liked them is because they were 
fighting against Marxists, and he was anti-Marxist. <clears throat> so, since there was a law that we couldn't trade with Iran, and Iran needed uh, military uh, equipment, Oliver North, a uh, lieutenant colonel in the uh, United States Marine Corps, uh, brokered a deal uh, where he we sent uh, uh, equipment to Iran, and Iran gave us money, and we gave the money to the Contras. We gave the money to the Contras, despite the fact that, that we weren't supposed to do anything with Iran. Or we weren't supposed to have any business with Iran. And Congress had decided that we were going to, we couldn't do anything as far as the Contras were concerned. And so we took the money that we, we took all this equipment and we sold it to the Iranians. And the Iranians paid us money and we took the money and gave it to the Contras. And that was the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, we circumvented Congress. Congress had said we couldn't do anything with the Nicaraguans and we couldn't do anything with the Iranians. And the president decided he was going to help the Contra by selling equipment to the Iranians, even though it was illegal, and, uh, and giving the money to the Contras. And this is the guy that did it. This is Oliver North. The Clinton-Lewinsky affair. Um, Monica Lewinsky was an intern. She was only 21 years old, and she had uh, an affair with Bill, the president of the United States, Bill Clinton. And this is Monica and Bill, and this is Monica and Bill. And what happened was uh, she befriended somebody, by the, a lady by the name of Linda Tripp. Um, and she would have these conversations with Lin Linda Tripp and explain to her that uh, what was going on between she and, and uh, the President of the United States. And what Linda Tripp did was uh, she recorded these uh, the conversations. Now, in Washington, D.C., and in Virginia, and in Maryland, it is against the law to tape somebody's conversation that you're having. You can't tape the conversation um, unless both parties know. And, of course, Lewinsky didn't know. Now, the interesting thing is this is what Linda Tripp looked like uh, this is what she looked like uh, when she was taping the uh, conversations. And the, Repu and the Republicans decided that they were going to, to do something with, uh, with Bill Clinton. And they dolled her all up. They, uh, they gave her a, a complete makeover. I, I thought that was kind of, kind of interesting. They do that a lot, as a matter of fact. One symptom of groupthink is an illusion of invulnerability causing group members to overestimate their group's might and right. The captain of the Titanic had once said God himself could not sink this ship. On April 14, 1912, while still on the ship's first voyage, the Titanic struck an iceberg and sank. Only 711 out of 2,224 people on board survived. Another symptom is an unquestioned belief in the group's morality, which also leads to overestimation of power. During the Watergate cover-up, Nixon and his advisors had several opportunities to admit their collusion, but just kept trying to hide their deeds. Eventually, Nixon resigned, and seven of his advisors went to prison. And here are six of them. The group tends to discount challenges by collectively rationalizing their decisions. When talking about escalating the Vietnam War, President Johnson held weekly Tuesday lunches discussing the war. Rather than talking about why, the meeting was mostly used to justify and explain the war. The Tuesday meetings turned into rationalization sessions for the Johnson administration. The group tends to stereotype their opponent as weak and unintelligent and incapable of legitimate retaliation. The Cuban immigrants who led the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961 convinced JFK that the Cuban military was weak and ill-equipped. They also argued that popular support in Cuba would be so great that there would be a general uprising. The invasion collapsed in two days. 
Pressures toward uniformity, conformity pressures uh, within the group by using ridicule and not allowing argument. Self-censorship is practiced by members to prevent ridicule. During the preparation for the Challenger flight, Thiokol engineer George McDonald wanted to postpone the flight. But instead of clearly stating, I recommend we don't launch below 53 degrees, he offered an equivocal opinion. He suggested that lower temperatures are in the direction of badness for both O-rings. What did he think uh, they should do? From his tempered words, of course, it's hard to tell. And, of course, the O-rings blew uh, and uh, the Challenger crashed, killing everybody on board. Because there is little opposition within the group, there is an illusion of unanimity. The group tends to protect, group from, uh, protect the group from information that would call into question the effectiveness of morality of their decisions, and these are known as mind guards. The conservative right has several mouthpieces that defended every action taken by the Republican administration in general and George W. Bush in particular, uh, Fox News, Pat Buchanan, and Rush Limbaugh. Uh, they also supported uh, Trump, of course, and there here is... Uh, what is that guy's name? Tucker Carlson. Yeah, and he has since, uh, Rush Limbaugh has since died. Uh, anyway, Pat, he just lost his job at Fox News. The wise leader can take several steps to avoid groupthink, remain impartial, seek outside opinions, create subgroups, seek uh, anonymous opinions. A uh, study by L.H. Chin in 2000 showed that death rates nearly doubled for 16- to 17-year-old drivers when they had two passengers rather than none. Were they more willing to take chances when others were egging them on and there was someone to show off for? And the answer is probably yes. Fortunately, President Kennedy learned from his mistakes with the Bay of Pigs decision and when he encountered his next major foreign policy decision, the Cuban Missile Crisis, he took uh, many of the, these steps to avoid groupthink. When his advisors met to decide what to do about this, the discovery of Soviet missiles in Cuba, Kennedy often absented himself from the group so as not to inhibit discussion. Kennedy brought in outside experts, for example, Adlie A. Stevenson, who were not members of the in-group, that uh, Kennedy successfully negotiated the removal of the Soviet missiles was almost certainly due to the improved method of decision, uh, group decision-making that he adopted. In 1961, James Stoner discovered that despite common knowledge that group behavior is more conservative than individual leadership, studies show that the opposite was true. Behind the anonymity of a group decision, committees were more likely to try risky behavior. This he referred to as the risky shift phenomenon. Groups committees tend to enhance pre-existing tendencies. They strengthen members' average tendency rather than split within the group. This is known as group polarization. This is one reason why hung juries are so rare. Deliberation tends to lead to group polarization. However, research also shows that people who hold strong opinions before deliberating maintain those opinions even stronger after deliberation. Group polarization is evident on college campuses where different fraternities maintain select reputations that tend to attract and polarize their members while independents are more likely to be less polarized and more liberal. So if you, uh, on college campuses, sororities and fraterni fraternities tend to be far more conservative than, uh, than independents. Delinquency is more likely where there are like-minded youth and, in fact, will increase at a greater level than the sum of its members. Terrorism does not spontaneously erupt, but is the result of like-minded people who evolve to violence. Great 
Uh, person theory purports that certain key personality traits make a person a good leader, regardless of the situation. A critical question is, what is the role of the leader in the group decision-making? The question of what makes a great leader has intrigued psychologists, historians, and political scientists for some time. And this is John Quincy Adams. He's actually a, an ancestor of mine. And this is what he said. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, then you are a leader. Personality and leadership abilities are weakly related. Compared to non-leaders, leaders tend to be slightly more intelligent, extroverted, confident, and charismatic. Surprisingly, few personality characteristics correlate strongly with leadership effectiveness. Simonton in 1987 and again in 2001 correlated all the factors of effective U.S. presidents and found three significant variables. One was being tall. Uh, the tallest uh, president was uh, Abraham Lincoln at 6'4 and a half. And the shortest was Jamie Madison at 5'4", I think. Coming from a small family, and of course Lincoln had, I think there were three in his family, and, and the other two died. A uh, number of books published before elections, and of course all three of those are very important. There are two basic styles of leadership. Transactional leaders, leaders who set clear short-term goals and reward people who meet them. Transactional leaders do a good job of making sure the needs of the organization are met and that things run smoothly. Now, for some reason, and this is, this is um, uh, Joseph McCarthy. McCarthy uh, started accusing people of, uh, they, they called him Tail Gunner Joe uh, because theoretically he was a tail gunner on a B-50, uh, a B-25. No, that's not right. Uh, B-17 during World War II. Turned out he wasn't. <laughs> anyway, that's what they called him, uh, Tail Gunner Joe. Uh, he was a congressman from uh, Wisconsin, and he accused um, the government of becoming communist. This was right after World War II. And he was attacking people in Hollywood. He was attacking uh, politicians. He was also attacking the military, and that was his downfall. So for like six years, um, he, uh, he controlled things in Congress, and people were deathly afraid of him because he would accuse them of being a communist. And eventually, and finally, uh, the military faced him and, and told him, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a lot more harm than you're doing good. So when we talk about the McCarthy era, it's, it was an era of fear because all somebody needed to do was accuse you of being a, uh, uh, of being a communist. And of course, uh, proving that you're not something is more, far more difficult than admitting that you are a part of something. Uh, transformational leaders, leaders who inspire followers to focus on common long-term goals, uh, it is transformational leaders, however, who think outside the box, identify important long-term goals, and inspire their followers to toil hard to meet these goals. And these are examples of transformational leaders, Benjamin Franklin, Henry Ford, Bill Gates, Walt Disney, Joan of Arc, and Jesus. Leadership effectiveness uh, depends both on how task-oriented or relationship-oriented the leader is and on the amount of control and influence the leader has over the group. Contingency theory of leadership is the idea that leadership effectiveness depends both on how task-oriented or relationship-oriented the leader is and on the, the amount of control and influence the leader has over the group. This theory was developed by IO psychologist Fred Fiedler. The contingency theory of leadership has been supported in studies of numerous types of leaders, including business managers, college administrators, military commanders, and postmasters. Two basic types, task-oriented leader, a leader concerned more with getting the job done than with workers' feelings and relationship relationships, and relationship-oriented leaders, a leader who is concerned primarily with workers' feelings and relationships. 
Task-oriented leaders are most effective in high-control work situations. Uh, leader-subordinate relationships are excellent. The work is structured and well-defined. Low-control work situations. Leader-subordinate relationships are poor. The work needing to be done is not clearly defined. Relationship-oriented leaders are most effective uh, moderate control work situations. Uh, it's fairly smooth, but some attention to poor relationship and hurt feelings is needed. When a task-oriented leader uh, has uh, alienated his workforce, and uh, this is what my wife did when she was in the service. Uh, she was a relationship-oriented leader, and she would go into uh, military hospitals and uh, she would repair the the uh, the relationships uh, that somebody else had uh, had had uh, destroyed. So she was the uh, uh, fire chief. She was the person that went in and cleaned things up after somebody else screwed them up. It may be difficult for women to achieve leadership positions. Look at Donald Trump's comments and reactions to the candidacy of Carly Fiorina who was able to marginalize her by attacking her looks, her voice, and her platform as pitter-patter. Many people uh, see good leaders as having agentic uh, traits, independent, aggressive, assertive, co competent. Women are stereotyped as having communal traits, friendly, unselfish, and expressive. Women are in a double bind as leaders. They are warm and communal. They are perceived as having low leadership potential. If they are agentic and forceful, they are often perceived negatively for not acting like a woman should. In 2014, only 24 of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies were women, and the board of directors of U.S. companies included only 17% women, and this is according to Catalyst in 2014. Things are not much different elsewhere. The 17% figure is actually among the highest in the world, except for Europe, where in Norway, 41% of the leader of the CEOs are women. In Sweden, 27%. In fin Finland, 27%. And the United Kingdom, 21%. In France, 18%. If a woman's style of leadership is stereotypically masculine, in that she is autocratic, bossy, and task-oriented, she's evaluated more negatively than men who have the same style. This is especially true if men are doing the evaluating. Another danger that women leaders face, women leaders face, because women are perceived as being more communal, they're often thought to be better at managing crises particularly ones that involve interpersonal problems, such as a conflict between high-level managers. That might seem like a good idea, trusting women leaders to solve problems, but it has a downside in which women are more likely to be put in precarious, high-risk positions where it is difficult to succeed. Michelle Ryan and her colleagues have called being put in crisis management roles dealing with interpersonal problems as a glass cliff. Oh no. Why did this happen? Wait a second. Um, ah. Let me do this again. Sorry. I apologize. Ah, I hit the wrong button. There we go. Sign in, and then it will think. We're talking about glass ceilings. And cancel, and this will go away in about 15 clicks. It wants me to look at my wife's iPad. And I don't know. There we go. Okay. Even when women have broken through the glass ceiling into top leadership positions, they're more likely than men to be put in charge of units that are in crisis and in which the risk failure is high. This is according to Michelle Ryan. And of course, in 2014, Mary Barra, 
uh, became the first C female CEO of a major global automaker, in this case General Motors. Within months, she had announced plans for General Motors to recall over 11 million cars due to defective design components that the company had known about for nearly 10 years. Could Barra become a, another example of a woman who broke through a glass ceiling only to find herself on a glass cliff? And the answer is no, she actually survived. Looking at the leadership around the world, researchers have discovered that different cultures see different attributes in their managers. An, uh, autonomous leadership, where the workers are independent of superiors, and the leader stays distant from the workers is popular in Europe, but not South and Central American countries. But there was universal agreement about the value of two leadership qualities, charisma and being team-oriented. Questions about cultural differences in leadership are receiving increasing attention because in a global e economy, work groups are becoming more div diverse and managers from different cultures have increasingly frequent contact. A social dilemma is a conflict in which the most beneficial action for an individual, if chosen by most people, will have harmful effects on everyone. What is best for an individual is not always best for the group as a whole. Consider a publishing venture by the novelist Stephen King. He wrote two installments of a novel called The Plant and posted them on the internet, asking readers to pay $1, $1 per installment. The deal he offered was simple. If at least 75% of the people who downloaded the installments paid the fee, he would keep writing and posting new installments. If fewer than 75% of the people paid, he would stop writing and the people would never get the rest of the novel. King had, a, had devised a classic social dilemma, a conflict in which most beneficial action for an individual will, if chosen by most people, be harmful to everyone. It was to any individual's financial advantage to download King's novel free of charge and let the other people pay. However, if too many people took this approach, everyone would lose because King said he would stop writing the novel. At first, people acted for the good of all. More than 75% paid for the first installment. As with many social dilemmas, however, people eventually acted in their own self-interest to the detriment of all. The number of people who paid for their later installments dropped below 75% and King stopped posting new, new uh, installments, saying on his website that the novel is in, on hiatus. A man and his girlfriend are arrested with five pounds of cocaine in their possession. They are separated. The prosecutor knows that if he can get one to turn, they can charge the other one with possession with the intent to distribute and put them in jail for 25 years. Otherwise, it's a five years and probation for both for possession. The person who testifies against their significant other will be charged with misdemeanor possession and get, get probation. So the question is, who blinks first, the man or the woman? The Prisoner's Dilemma was originally developed by Flood and Drescher at RAND, uh, the RAND Corporation Research and Development, in 1950 as some of the original games in the game theory scenario. The concept was later revised by Taylor in 1992. Okay. And, of course, there is no answer. Uh, but I have had uh, I had a student who uh, was in exactly the same situation. It wasn't the 25 years or five years situation, but what uh, what eventually happened is that she would not uh, rat on her boyfriend, and her boyfriend ratted on her, and she's the one that spent all the time in jail, and he went free. And that's the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, modification of the Prisoner's Dilemma, the Wall Street game, uh, two players, uh, there are two players, they can pick option X or Y. If they both pick X, they both win $3.
If they both pick Y, they both lose a dollar. If you pick X and your friends pick fin prex, fin pr picks Y, you lose $6 and your friend wins $6. If you pick Y and your friend picks X, you win $6 and your friend loses $6. People are more likely to adopt a cooperative strategy of playing the game with a friend, expecting to interact with a partner in the future. So all you have to oops, I'm sorry. So all you have to do is pick X. If you both pick X, both of you win three dollars. But if you pick Y and they pick X, you lose money and your friend wins money. Okay, so you get the picture. So if everybody picks X every time, then everybody wins. But if you pick Y when they pick X, then they lose $6 and you gain $6. So the question is, what are you going to do? If you keep picking X and your friend keeps picking Y, then you lose $6 every time they pick Y and you pick X. People are more likely to adopt a cooperative strategy of playing the game with a friend, expecting to interact with a partner in the future. Exchanging name, uh, changing name from Wall Street game to the community game increased the percentage of people who cooperated from 33% to 71% in one study. The tit-for-tat strategy is a means of encouraging cooperation by a first acting cooperatively, but then always responding the way your opponent did, cooperatively or competitively, on the previous trial. In other words, if he picked Y uh, on the previous trial, then in the next, uh, the next trial you pick Y as well. The analogy to the arms race would be uh, to match not only one military any military buildup by, uh, made by an unfriendly nation, but also uh, any conciliatory gesture, such as a ban on nuclear testing. In the 1960s, game theory was still predicting re reactions to the Cold War. Deutsch and Krauss in 1960 and 1962 demonstrated that threats were not an effective means of reducing conflict. They developed the game of conflict called trucking game. The results of the study showed that when there was an equal reaction to a threat, the threatened side would retaliate against threats in kind, making it a no-win situation. Cooperation was the only way to win. And this is what happened during the uh, Cold War. Uh, we were facing off against the Russian or the Soviet Union, and we kept threatening them, and they kept threatening us. And because of that, we both kept escalating. In other words, we built, built more nuclear weapons, and so did they. But nothing, not, nothing good was happening. In the trucking game, so, so they came up with these, gaming, these games to figure out what was going to happen next. And one of them is the trucking game. In the trucking game, players earned money by driving from one point to another as quickly as possible. As in the image below, the shortest route in their game required crossing a one-lane road, but both companies could not use this road at the same time. When players were given gates they could use to restrict the other player's use of the one-lane road, both companies made even less money because they had the gates closed all the time and the other company couldn't use it. In the initial Deutsch and Krauss trucking game, the two sides could not communicate with each other. They ran another version of the study where participants were required to communicate. The results, they were reduced, uh, there were reduced losses somewhat in the unilateral threat condition, but it failed to increase cooperation in the other two conditions. Communication in the trucking studies did not foster trust. So just because we could communicate with the Russians didn't mean that the Russians and we were going to start uh, negotiating. The problem with the communication in the trucking study is that it did not foster trust. In fact, people used the intercom to threaten each other. 
Negotiation is a form of communication between opposing sides in a conflict in which offers and counteroffers are made and a solution occurs only when both parties agree. An integrative solution is a solution to a conflict whereby parties made trade-offs on issues according to their different interests. Each side concedes the most on issues that are unimportant but it, uh, to, to it but important to the other side. People often find it difficult to identify integrative solutions. People will tend to distrust proposals made by the other side and to overlook interests that they have in common. When negotiating, integrative solutions are often available. Work on gaining trust and communicating. Remember, people often construe situations differently. Neutral mediators often help solve labor disputes, legal battles, and divorce proceedings by recognizing that there are mutually agreeable solutions to a conflict. And that is the end of the lecture.